All right, welcome everybody. Can uh, you guys hear me in the far back? Yes, all right, good. Okay, so welcome to day two of 33rd degree. Are you guys having a good time? Yeah. You still awake so far? It's towards the end of the day, so hopefully your coffee helped you a bit for this portion. I know it did for me. So this session is called Expect the Unexpected. Um, and what we'll be talking about is exception handling um, and handling errors in your applications, in your Java uh, enterprise applications. So first, just a little bit of background about me. My name is Keto. Uh, I run a company called Virtua, which does training, consulting, uh, mentoring, uh, etc., mostly around Java EE, uh, JSF, and uh, related technologies. And uh, as a result of this, I've seen a lot of code over the past several years at different client sites. Um, and seeing that code has sort of given me a lot of uh, uh, material for talks like this, I should say. Uh, I also wrote a book a long, long time ago called JSF in Action. I run a website called JSF Central. I've spoken at lots of conferences. And I'm also a, mu a member of the Java community process, normally involved with uh, JSF and portlets and things like that. So, the, one of the first things I want you to take away from this presentation is that bad things happen. No matter what you think about your application or how wonderful your code uh, is from your perspective, um, bad things do happen. You could have a torrential downfall, you know. You thought the day was going out, going uh, pretty well, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, you can't drive really, right? And you could have a huge traffic jam, right? You thought you were going to be home, you know, for dinner, and all of a sudden, uh, your day, your daily commute looks like this, right? And what I often hear from developers is, oh, that should never happen. You say, hey, you're not handling this condition. And they say, oh, that'll never happen. That should never happen. And the reality is that bad things actually do happen. You know, there are a lot of natural disasters, right? Tornadoes, they happen. Uh, and uh, also horrible things like this happen, tsunamis, right? And you notice, uh, you know, just in, in normal everyday life, different communities do much better when they have done some planning, right? Whenever you hear about a natural disaster and uh, a lot of people uh, got hurt or died or there were lots of issues, normally it's because they didn't do any planning whatsoever. They said, huh, that should never happen, right? Well, there are some things that are kind of hard to plan for. I mean... Perhaps if we have an alien invasion, you may not really be able to plan for that as, as a municipality or a city or a country. But for the most part, these are things that, that we actually understand to some degree. And an important thing to remember is that some bad things seem minor, right? So, uh, you know, here's an example of a very simple little pipe, right? Uh, it's just a little little hole, a little bit of rust, not a big deal, right? Not a big deal until it leaks and causes lots of issues. Or you could have, you know, potholes, right? So potholes don't seem like such a big deal, but you ever notice how much nicer it is when you're on a road that's been freshly paved, you know, no potholes? Uh, ever notice that... Uh, in, I know at least for our car, we've got an older car, but still throughout the years, um, the alignment gets messed up from things like potholes. And potholes can actually grow to become much bigger problems, right? They can cause accidents. If no one ever repaired the potholes and they all said, eh, it's just a little minor little hole, then we'd have lots of uh, other issues to worry about. So what exactly is an exception? An exception is something accepted. It's an instance or a case not conforming to the general rule. Okay? So basically, an exception is anything that's not normal. Okay? And in any application, you need to be able to deal with situations where things are not normal. 
um, because if you don't deal with them, um, they end up showing up in different ways. So another important rule is to expect bad things, okay? So instead of saying that should never happen, think, what if that happened? If that happened, how would my application deal with it? Would it crash? Would it fail hard? Would that error be logged? Would um, the user even be able to notice? Would the user have a completely strange experience? You know, maybe the application would behave in an unexpected manner, okay? So expect bad things. And another important rule is that regardless of what is happening, your application should be in a consistent state. So what I mean by consistent is that the data that it holds should be accurate and correct, okay? The UI should, should behave in a consistent manner. It should behave correctly. And in general, um, if something bad goes on, your application shouldn't completely crash, right? There should be, your application should have some consistency in it, okay? So a few uh, exception handling aphorisms I'd like to go over. Number one, and this is one of the most important things for Java developers, is do not eat exceptions, okay? So next time you're about to go eat an exception because uh, the API has forced you to catch it, uh, think about it and don't do it. Um, I'd say uh, I, I see a lot of code and probably about 5% of the cases where I see someone eating an exception, it's, it's okay to do, okay, about 5%. So this is what I mean by eating exceptions. How many people have seen code like this? Okay, so Feast and Murphy. Are you sure that's all? Some of you not raise your hand. Okay. So um, as you can see here, uh, we have a very uh, simple method, right? We do try catch because it's throwing a database exception. And then we just output it because we figure, well, we might as well log it or something, right? Um, but this causes issues, so please try to avoid it. And the general rule is that if you can recover from it, um, catch it, and tell the user if necessary, okay? So the, the key part of this, though, is if you can recover from it, okay? Um, so for uh, example, this error, the previous one here, you can recover from it, right? Um, oops. Uh, there is something you can do to ensure your application is in, in a consistent state in this scenario, right? There are other cases where, you know, uh, something may happen in your application and, you know, there's really not much you can do about it. Your application is now useless until that has been rectified, right? So let's say that for every single call that comes in, you have to talk to an LDAP server to verify that user. For whatever, for whatever reason, there's nothing cached. We'll, we'll, we'll lay that aside. But if that's the case, and the LDAP server is down, well, eh, your application really can't do much, right? So maybe you just tell the user, hey, LDAP server down, I can't do anything, come back later, right? Maybe you log it. Maybe your logger sends an email, who knows, okay? Um, so here's an example of recovering uh, somewhat gracefully, right? So. Uh, what we've done here is we call the method, right? Um, and uh, if there's an exception, we just display an error back saying, hey, there's a database error, okay? This presumably gets displayed somehow by the UI and the user sees a message. And then we go ahead and log it saying, oh, we can't access the database, okay? So now your application actually is handling the error. You know, it's, it's something you can recover from. You don't necessarily need to crash the UI completely, but you can tell the user, ah, there's something wrong. Okay, so, so this is an example of how you might want to handle an error. If you cannot recover from an error, don't catch it, okay? So this is a very important lesson. Um, if you cannot recover from the error, do not catch it. In many cases, you can't recover from it. Essentially, um, you've gotten some exception back from another layer somewhere, and there's really not much you can do about it. Um, there's 
really probably no reason for you to go ahead and log it or just catch it and eat it, okay? Because that level, the, the top level, the lev layer calling you may know what to do with it, okay? So if that's the case, you should just throw it and say, yep, yeah, okay, whoever called me, like, I don't know what to do with this. Whoever called me, go ahead and deal with it. And I think part of the reason that people often feel like they need to catch an exception is because we feel like we need to do something, right? But it's okay to admit that your code does not know how to do, not, does not know how to handle this particular exception, okay? And in that case, throw it. Whoever's calling you should know how to deal with it, okay? So in this example, it's the same code, but we're saying we really don't know how to handle it, which may or may not be true depending on the application, right? But in this example, we are throwing the exception and letting the layer that called this code actually handle it, okay? So here's an example. So, we've got a very simple application. This is a JSF application, but it could be any web framework. It doesn't have to be JSF. It could be any Java application. Okay. All right, so I have a simple page, right? I'm going to, uh, you know, type in uh, my widget is the name. Um, this is when it was created. Uh, there's my size, whatever, okay. So I hit create. And it says, your widget has been created successfully. So I'm like, all right, good. I did my work, I created my widget. I can go in and create another widget, okay? However, if you happen to look at the uh, logs, oh, look, lo and behold, there's an exception, okay? So we see there is this uh, database exception in that method, okay? So in that method uh, that was called, which is this method here, there was a database exception, and what happened? We ate it, right? So we caught the exception, we, we logged it. And you see what the actual behavior of the application is, right? The application is continuing because we just logged it. The user didn't see anything, any feedback. Our code continued to the next line, which displays the message, and that's what they see, okay? So in reality, the user experience is that things are going well, right? But in reality, their data never got saved, okay? Uh, this is something I see a lot of, uh, where people are like, oh, well, this, you know, this page doesn't do X, Y, Z. You know, they're unsure why it's not working, and a lot of the times it's because someone somewhere caught an exception they didn't know how to handle, okay? And then the other code just proceeded. And sometimes what can happen is your application can become inconsistent at this point, right? So perhaps, um, that method was supposed to put some variable in some object somewhere, right? And it didn't because of the exception. And then what happened was that, you know, some other parts of the code didn't work properly. So you end up with very uh, complicated behavior, which is difficult to debug, but it all boils down to the fact that a particular exception wasn't caught, okay? So we can take a look at the same code. So this is the same uh, similar page, right? And uh, we can create an exception. And so here's what's happening is we caught it and we displayed an error message back to the user saying, oh, database error occurred, try again later. So now the user experience is not messed up, but they know they can't do anything with this page right now. So this is a pretty good example of something that, you know, you can inform the user. Um, they can, you know, presumably there's something else they can do with the application. Maybe that part of the application works fine, okay? Um, and hopefully you've logged it so that the user can be informed in some way. So let's look at this code. And actually, if you look at the console, in this example, we still have the same exception, right? There was a null pointer exception in this notification engine, um, which was in the background, um, and the exception was thrown here, okay? Uh, actually, this, it's... Uh, 
that's actually not the right one. That's the widget provider, which actually threw the exception to begin with. Let me go up the stack trace a bit. Okay, here we go. So this was the one where we just output the uh, exception. Let me find the right one. Okay. So this is the actual stack trace here, or this is the actual code. So you see here, we're saving it. We catch the exception, um, and we display the error, and we also log it so that we actually have it in the logs. Okay. So this is definitely better. So now the user experience is consistent, and uh, we've also logged it so that uh, we can be informed of it in some way. So that's one of the first things. So another thing to remember is that if something does go wrong, try to ensure the consistency. And this is what I said earlier, right? So, you know, catching the exception and then uh, sending a message back to the user is one way to do this. Um, also, um, in cases where you do have to deal with um, something that has uh, some actual resource, you need to make sure, of course, of course, that you close it, right? So in this example, um, we're catching it and throwing it in one case, um, and then also we are have a finally clause to close a session, right? So remember that as well, that if you are actually working with a resource that has some lifespan, you remember to close it in a finally clause um, if necessary, okay? Um, and also, it, this scenario doesn't just work for, you know, streams and, uh, you know, sessions and databases. It also works for scenarios where you have application state in your object, I mean, in your application, which could actually be uh, uh, messed up by the error that occurred. So another thing to do is use a logging framework. How many people here use log4j or Apache logging or something like that? Okay, okay so that's most of you. Um, believe it or not, I have clients that actually don't. Um, and another important thing here is consistently, right? So you may use it in your code, but if your coworkers don't use it in the rest of the application, you're really not having a very uh, uh, cohesive experience for logging. Okay. Uh, how many of you use loggers for things like um, generating emails or some sort of push notification to let people know that there's an exception? Okay, so a few of you do, which is good. So this is one of the things that people often don't do. They throw stuff in a log, and then they have to go back and comb the logs right? They have to get log analyzers, etc. cetera. Um, but it's very easy with all the common logging frameworks to actually, and I don't necessarily just mean Apache Commons logging, I just mean logging frameworks in general. It's very easy to go and uh, create appenders, which actually will send an email, okay? Or do some other notification to let people know that there's a problem. So you don't have to wait till your users call and complain. You can actually go ahead and uh, handle uh, the issue up right away. And another thing which you should try and do is not log an exception more than one time, okay? So how many of you have seen a, track st a stack trace where you see the same exception printed like three or four times and it takes you like a half an hour to figure out where the root cause was? Okay, maybe 20 minutes, but uh, all right. So um, this is a common problem. Um, and I, I think, you know, as developers, we forget that people have to look at logs and that part of your job in making good software is ensuring that the artifacts it creates, whether it's you know, the pages that people see, or the documentation, or the logs that it creates, are actually well done. They're actually usable and readable by other people. Okay. So, if we take a look at this uh, other example here, um, we'll go back to the unexpected page. Okay. And we'll... Uh, Maximize the console, figure it out, okay. So we put in our data. Okay. Okay. All right, so let's see what kind of output we have here. So down here is the root cause, right? This is the, uh, there is a null pointer thrown in this notification engine class, okay? And I can go up and I can see, okay, well, um, it's caused by a notification exception, 
okay? Um, and then I go up here and I see um, there's database exception thrown. Um, and uh, then I go up here and I see the notifications exception again. And then I see a null pointer again. And then I see this, the root cause, well, one of the main exceptions up here, okay? So I've repeated things a few times. And the way this happens is it happens because everyone's not following the principle of uh, not handling an exception if you don't know what to do about it, right? So we take a look at this notification engine class. So it, it's a very powerful class, you see, it throws an exception, but we'll assume it was trying to do something first. So it's uh, just an application scope, singleton, you know, it could be CDI or Spring, whatever. Um, but it's throwing an exception, okay? So what was, ca what was calling this was another class uh, called the notification service. So the notification service does this, and this is often what I see as well. So it doesn't eat the exception, which is great, okay? But whoever wrote this felt the need to still log it, because, eh, well, I got an exception, I should log it, right? And they're doing e.print stack trace. So there's two things wrong with this. Number one, they didn't have to log it, because it should be logged at a higher level, right? Number two, they're doing e.print e stack trace. They're not using any logging API whatsoever, right? So whatever facilities we've built into the logging settings, whatever, you know, maybe we set the logging to be only error mode, maybe we have different appenders, maybe we have a rollover adapter in our logging framework, whatever it is, it's not happening because they just did EDAP print stack trace. Okay. So this is being called by the widget provider. Okay. And they're doing the same thing. Uh, we call the public the, the notification service, um, and we print out the stack trace, and then we throw an exception. Okay. Another thing I see often is this. Has anyone seen anything wrong with that? Anybody? Okay, so good. So uh, the problem with this is that, well, now we've lost the stack trace completely, right? So, you know, the exceptions uh, API lets you easily send the root cause exception in, but here we're just basically uh, eating it, essentially, okay? So try and avoid that as well. Um, there's really no reason to display the message here, but if you must, at least send the original exception back in there. Okay. So what's happening here is at two different layers, there's an e.print stack trace, right? And then when we get up to the actual um, the actual uh, top layer, which is the uh, web application. We are doing it again, right? And we're just displaying the message back that it's being created. So essentially, the stack trace is being printed three times, OK? So the way you avoid this is by simply not printing it unless you um, are at the top level, OK? So if we look at, uh, let's clear the logs again. We go to the other one. Put in something here and do create. We got the error message. And then what do we see here? We see a single stack trace, right? It says oh, notification exception, um, error connecting database, and then the root cause is down here, okay? And we have one timestamp for this one error, okay? So if we look at these individual artifacts, the notification engine, it just throws an old pointer exception and doesn't log it, right? 
and the uh, notification engine. I'm sorry, need to go for more layer. Notification service. We'll, we'll go to the widget, widget provider. Okay, um, that's not the right one. That's what happens when you have two copies of the same thing in your project? Okay. So we see here we're just throwing the exception again. So essentially, we're throwing it at each level, okay? We're not handling it because these layers don't need to handle it, right? You're basically saying the responsibility for handling this exception belongs to someone else, okay? So some useful tips for avoiding the uh, dreaded uh, never-ending stack trace. Whoops. Okay. So no, another important thing is to throw meaningful exceptions. Um, often I see developers, you know, if they want to throw an exception, they'll just throw a new exception. Okay. Well, that's nice. That's good that you're throwing an exception when necessary, right? But, you know, you can create your own exception hierarchy, and you can have exceptions which mean things. And they don't have to have any special data. They don't have to have any new behavior. The whole purpose of it is a different type, right? They're called, classes are called types, and you can have different types of exceptions, right? So you can have your own entity exists exception, um, entity not found, no results, you know, framework exception, whatever it needs to be. But uh, if you're starting on a new project, uh, spend, you know, some time coming up with an exception hierarchy for the low-level parts of the application so that when the exceptions do get logged, they actually are meaningful um, without having to have a description. So, you know, in, in an application, often you get a null pointer exception or something. Well, you know, maybe there's no text describing about why there was a null pointer exception, but you know it's a null pointer exception. You know it means that there was nothing, there was, someone was trying to ref reference something which did not exist. Another thing you notice here is that um, I have, I'm subclassing a runtime exception. So, it is a bit of a debate as to whether um, checked exceptions in Java are a good thing. Um, I'm not convinced they are. Um, I was actually talking with Ted Nord about it earlier. Um, and, uh, you know, for better or worse, they exist. So basically the idea is in Java, right? If you, uh, have, if you don't subclass runtime exception, you just subclass exception or one of its subclasses, um, you are required to put it in the throws clause if you throw it, right? Um, if you uh, subclass runtime exception, um, you do not have to put it in the throws clause. And the idea, of course, is that you know, if you want to force your caller to handle the exception, then you should go ahead and make it a, a non-runtime exception. If you don't expect the caller to know what to do with it, then you should make it a runtime exception. And I argue that most of the time, developers don't know what to do with it. <laughs> so. You may as well make them all runtime exceptions. Uh, there are, of course, cases where that's not true. Um, but I'm sure, like, how many people have caught an exception because you had to, but you really didn't see any reason you needed to catch it? Anybody? OK. So by making things runtime exceptions, you don't have people eating exceptions because they don't feel like they have to catch it, right? Um, so my preference when it comes to designing a framework is to make things runtime exceptions. Um, if you choose to make them uh, checked exceptions, then you need to make sure the developers understand how to handle them and handle them in a consistent manner. Okay. So another important thing to do is to centralize exception handling. So I said before that if you don't know how to handle an exception, you shouldn't handle it, right? Which I still agree with. But someone has to handle it somewhere, right? So generally speaking, whatever type of application you're building, there needs to be some, some exception handler somewhere which gets those exceptions, but it should be at the top level, not at the lower levels of the application. So 
So a centralized exception handler can do things like logging, all right? So it'll help you log things in one place, so other layers do not feel like they have to log things. It can help out with notifications, whether that means logging or whether that means sending an email or something else, who knows? And it can also help with an error page. So in uh, UI applications, you can actually display an error page back to the user. And if you handle it in a centralized place, then you can display the error. You can basically say, if there's an exception, then I'm going to display an error page. But when you're writing the everyday code, the developers don't have to worry about it because it's going to be handled in one place. Okay. So if you're writing a web application um, with, with a uh, more standard UI, you can just declare an error page in uh, the web.xml file. And this basically says any exception at all is going to be sent to this page. Very straightforward. Um, of course, you can send different pages to different types. Okay? So you can say, well, if it's this type of exception, then display this page. If it's this type of exception, display that page. And I'm sure you can do this with pretty much any web framework as well. Um, this is just standard servlet stuff, but um, I'm sure uh, your web framework has some solution for this as well. Um, in JSF2, there is a custom exception handler, which you can, do, which you can subclass uh, to essentially provide additional functionality for any exceptions that get bubbled up through the framework. And uh, basically, what you can do is wrap the existing functionality, and then inside of it, you can uh, override this handle method, and in there you can get all the exceptions that were thrown. So sometimes there may be multiple exceptions thrown throughout the life cycle of a request, and you can get them all here, and then log them or whatever you need to do. In uh, CDI, um, there is something called Apache Delta Spike. How many people here use CDI? I'm curious. Oh, so, okay. And how many people have heard of Apache Delta Spike? Okay, good. So uh, Delta Spike is one of those libraries that provides basically anything else that you need to do with CDI that CDI doesn't do out of the box. For those of you who are not aware, CDI is context, dependent, context and Dependency Injection in Java, which is the Dependency Injection framework that's part of Java EE um, 6, 7, etc. Um, but uh, Delta Spike has a very nice uh, way to handle exceptions here. Um, you can just say your class is an exception handler, um, you can say handles, uh, web request, and you can also pick other types of requests. This assumes it's not a REST request, but you could also do a REST request if you wanted to. Um, then you get your logger thrown in, and then you can log it or whatever you need to do. Okay? So that's how you can do a, c a centralized handling with Delta Spike. Spring MVC has a similar mechanism. Um, inside of your controller, you can specify an IO exception or an exception handler. Um, specify whatever types you want it to handle. And then you can do whatever you need to do there. Okay. Maybe it's logging, maybe it's sending them to an error page, maybe it's both. Okay. So basically, no matter which framework you're using, there's some central way that you can handle those exceptions. Okay. Um, this is another example in Spring MVC. Um, this is, in this example, we're basically um, not doing any UI stuff, but here we are. So, we're uh, returning a um, uh, model and view class um, as well. So this, in this example, we can go to an error page. So another thing you should do is uh, try and handle um, browser exceptions. So um, how many people here have JavaScript in their web applications? Okay. Uh, that's more than I, that's fewer than I expected. Um, all right, so uh, one of the things which I find often gets left out of this is the browser side of things, right? So um, we all know that uh, you know JavaScript is not so graceful with errors by default, right? So um, there's a few different errors, a few different ways or places where you can handle this these types of exceptions, okay? One is in the JavaScript code itself, or I, to be more clear, these are really more errors, areas where there may be exceptions, okay? So one is in the JavaScript code. So let's say you wrote some JavaScript code and you just have a bug in there somewhere, right? Um, often what happens in JavaScript is nothing. Right? JavaScript silently displays to the console that there's some error in your code and the user has no clue. 
Also, errors can happen that are returned from AJAX requests. Okay? So maybe your application made an AJAX request, maybe it tried to get some JSON back, maybe it just tried to do old-fashioned AJAX and update part of the page, um, but there is an exception um, during the back-end processing. Okay? Or um, maybe there is a problem with the network, right? So again, your application tried to make a request in the background to do something, and the net, you know, there is some problem with the network and it couldn't complete the request, okay? So these are all scenarios you should deal with as well, okay? Because now we have you know, two very distinct parts of the application. We have what runs in the browser and what runs on the server. Both need to be able to handle uh, exceptions. So. Let's say that we have, go back to unexpected, um, a simple little JS error, right? So I'm going to press this button. Oh, I'll type in something here. Okay. And I'm pressing the button, and lo and behold, nothing happens. So, anyone ever seen this behavior before? Oh, I clicked on the button, and nothing happens, right? So, if you look at the JavaScript console, we see oh, there is a reference error. Undeclared variable is not defined, right? So all that's happening here is that we are down here. Again, this is JSF. It could be any any framework, any uh, technology, um, but uh, here we're clicking on a button and um, we're calling a method on click, right? And that method just happens to be referencing a variable which wasn't defined yet, okay? So we get an, we get an error. Um, and we see that the application just continues and, you know, everything, nothing really happens much, okay? Um, in more complicated scenarios, what, what can happen is your, app, your entire application will stop working because some fundamental uh, piece of JavaScript code has malfunctioned in some way, right? And then, you know, maybe your user can refresh the page and it'll work. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a very frustrating user experience, right? To have your page just suddenly stop working, okay? So there are a few ways we can handle this. And this is just one scenario. This is just the scenario of, um, you know, co bugs in your JavaScript code. So if we look at this example, okay. All right, so we hit this button and now we get an error message. Okay. Oh, sorry, an unexpected error has occurred. Please refresh the page. Okay, not 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 the most professional message in the world. Uh, but it's a message nonetheless. So if you you know, if you're not using any special JavaScript framework, there's a very easy way you can do this. And that is with uh, this particular code right here. Okay. All right. So window dot on error equals function. Okay. So there's actually you can uh, add to the window object uh, your own error handler, and this will basically catch any random JavaScript error. Okay. Um, and I highly suggest that you you do this in your applications, or at least do the framework equivalent for whatever JavaScript framework you're using. Okay. So that's one scenario. Now, there are some other scenarios, okay? So, okay. Um, another scenario uh, is if you uh, create here, and this is the error scenario, right? So what's happening here is we have an AJAX request, it's going to the server, there is an exception on the server, and because of the way the uh, JSF AJAX stuff works, it's sending the exception back to the client, okay? Um, and this message actually comes from JSF, but you know, a different web framework might handle stuff differently. Um, and in this scenario, this message only comes back in like uh, the development mode of JSF. If you were in production mode, this wouldn't happen. And then you get another silent message, or another silent, basically, call, okay? So on the server, we're still seeing that same stack trace that we saw before, okay? 
So, um, in JSF, you can uh, do this code here, which basically gives you an error handler for AJAX requests. Okay. So here we're saying we're just basically adding an error handler for any any AJAX request. But what this is going to do is be called in cases where there's an exception coming back from the server. Okay. Okay. So now I get my custom message back. Now in this scenario where there's error message coming back from the server you have this option of actually catching the exception and then dealing with it in your UI, right? Um, or uh, you may decide that you um, would prefer that the framework redirect the user to an error page as opposed to sending an AJAX request back, okay? And you can do that with JSF with some different um, exception handlers and um, I'm sure in other frameworks you can do that as well. So you can say, all right, well, if I get an exception and it's an AJAX request, why don't I just redirect the user to a page? instead of having to send the message back to the UI. And that really depends on how much interactivity there is in the JavaScript layer of your application. If you've got a fully single page, heavy JavaScript app, you're gonna wanna handle the exception right up front, right? And say, oh, there was an error in the back end, do something else, okay? Um, but if you have something that has less JavaScript, you may want to send into an error page or something, okay? Now, one of the other things, um, well, there's one other level, okay? So this is just the the error message coming back from the server, okay? Now, this here is um, jQuery's error handler. How many people use jQuery? Okay, decent number. Okay, so J jQuery uses uh, Ajax, and has a very nice Ajax API, and Prime Faces, which is the component suite I'm using, uses uh, jQuery underneath. So these requests are being sent using jQuery. So if I uh, become really bold and turn off um, actually, turning off internet access is not going to make a difference here. Um, but let's say I just um, stop my server. Okay. So I stop my server, and now I'm going to hit... Oh, so now I'm getting an error message, right? So I stop the server, the server's not responding, and I'm getting an error message because I set up the jQuery error handler. And this is because I know that Prime Faces uses jQuery underneath. So it tried to create a jQuery AJAX request. Um, it didn't work because the server's down. Okay. And then it went to my error handler here, um, which just displayed that error message. Okay. So that's another scenario, right? So that's all three scenarios. One is bug in your own JavaScript code. One is bug on the server or issue on the server, exception on the server. And the other one is um, a problem with the actual transport mechanism, a, pop, a problem with the client talking to the server. So those are three cases that you need to handle, okay? Now, one of the things you can also do, one of the disconnects with JavaScript is that in these scenarios, okay, in these scenarios what's happening is there's an error on the client with the exception of the server-based one where we're doing an AJAX request and there's an exception on the server. In the other cases, what's happening is we're not getting any real logging, right? There's an error on the client. You don't know about it on the server. So what happens is you get user reports back saying, oh, this part doesn't work, this page doesn't work right, there's a bug, and then it's kind of hard to debug what's going on. You basically have to recreate their scenario exactly on your machine to see what the JavaScript console is saying, right? So one of the strategies you can use to avoid this is basically say, okay, if there is an error in JavaScript, I can inform the user or whatever, but why don't I also just tell the server what's going on as well, okay? And this can work in some cases. It's obviously not gonna work if you can't reach the server, right? If the server is down, this is not gonna work. If there's no connectivity, it's not gonna work. But in the other scenarios, this can actually work out quite well. So what you can do is write a very simple, um, well, there's different ways to do it. One of the ways you can do this is have a function like this one called display error page, okay? And all it does is it sends, it basically uh, changes the URL uh, to an error page, even for a JavaScript error, okay? And it sends the actual error that occurred in the application uh, in JavaScript to the server, okay? And the server can do what it wants to with it. So what we can do here is we can 
change this to display, display error page. Send in message URL line. Oops. Okay. So now if there's a JavaScript uh, error there, we can actually go and send the message. We can also do the same thing here, although it'd be less likely to be useful there because the server might actually be down. Okay. So let's try it now. Oh, thank you. It's one of the wonderful thing about having an audience that's paying attention. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to uh, create this uh, recoverable error. No, I get an error page, right? It's a very lovely error page. <laughs> um, but uh, this is the uh, error page, the same one that you see for a full page request. So if I gone gone back here and did a, done a um, full page request, I would have gotten the same error. So that was just a full form submit. Okay. So now, even though the error occurred in JavaScript, I'm actually getting some feedback um, on the server. And you don't, you know, in this scenario, you don't have to send them to an error page. You could tell the server what's going on in many different ways via REST or by accessing a page, et cetera, and still handle it in the UI if you wanted to, right? But what's happening here is you're seeing the messages being sent here. And then in this particular page, I have an event registered for this page, another JSF thing, but it could be talking directly to a, an action controller or whatever in another framework. And you see it's calling a method called log client exception. Okay, so the message in the page was, you know, something bad happened, but we actually logged it just by setting those parameters. Okay, so that uh, class looks like this. It's very simple. Um, it just logs the exception. Nothing special, and only does it if the message is not null. Okay, so now even though it's a JavaScript error, I actually have feedback in the logs. Um, so I can go back and say, okay, well, well, we got complaints about this problem on this day. Let's go in the logs and see what's going on, and we can say, oh, well, really, if we look here, it was AJAX server error. Okay, error connecting a database description, etc. Okay, so that one was a, a database error. So if I had gone back. Um, and done this one, which is just a pure J pure JavaScript exception, right? Um, I would have gotten this message. Uncaught reference error, undeclared variable is not defined, right? That was a JavaScript error. And you can see I've also got the URL and the line number, okay? So this is the same information that's available in JavaScript, but all I did was send it back to the server and log it, okay? So now I don't have a scenario where I have errors in JavaScript which I don't have any record of, right? Um, that are difficult for me to reproduce and debug. Now I have a scenario where I can say, okay, well I know on uh, you know the sixth of July of June, what happened was there was um, a call to a method that had an undeclared variable, okay, and it's in this page, okay. So this is just some strategies for ensuring that not only do you handle things properly with exceptions on the server, but you also keep in mind what's happening on the client as well. So the number one point I want you to take away is do not eat exceptions, okay? Um, Ensure that your application is in a consistent state. Handle exceptions in a uh, centralized manner. Okay. And ensure that your exception handling occurs on the client and on the server. Okay. Um, when you're developing code at different levels, do not uh, arbitrarily log it or call e.printStatTrace. Okay. 
And uh, I guarantee you, if you follow these uh, strategies, um, you'll have happier users and you'll be happier developers too, um, because it'll be much easier for you to track down issues. Okay. All right, so I think I actually uh, have time for questions. Any questions? Yes. So the question is, if you have an uh, exception lower down in your call stack, essentially, in, in your application, that's storing one type of exception, should you then wrap it at a higher level into a different type of exception? And I think it really depends on sort of how your application is designed, right? So if you have one monolithic application where everything's in the same you know, package or the same set of packages, you really don't have a layered architecture, then there's really probably not much of a point, right? But if you have a layer ar layered architecture where you've defined for each layer certain exception types, then you should wrap them. So for example, one of the projects I'm on now, there's uh, two different framework levels. There's like the business framework level and there's the uh, UI framework level, right? So any exceptions from the business framework level are wrapped as a business framework exception before they get up to the UI level, okay? And what that allows us to do is basically, number one, ensure that everything is a runtime exception, because that's what those are, okay? And then it also makes it very clear that that's the layer where that exception came from, okay? So I, I would say it makes sense to do it, you know, depending on what layers you're at, but you wouldn't want to do it every single time, right? Because then you might end up with like, you know, four or five exceptions, which you may not really need, okay? Any other questions? All right, thank you guys for coming. Just a, a shameless plug, I'm doing a session tomorrow morning on JavaScript as an assembly language, if you're interested. Thanks.